there's a power in being stupid, asking stupid questions. And I like that. And be naive and stupid. It's the Be Stupid campaign from Diesel, one of the most brilliant campaigns about attitude. Because when you're smart, when you know you're smart, you think you know everything, but you, you've got some uh, ready-made thoughts. Whether when you're stupid, you just question everything. Like, yeah, but why is that? Why doesn't this not the other way? So uh, I always try to go with a problem with uh, the most stupid questions. This week's guest is Christian Beaujard, president of French ad agency Les Présidents. As my second storyteller guest, his story intersects with mine back in the late 90s and early 2000s when we worked together in a London ad agency called Euro RSCG Winnet Gosper. During this period, working on the Microsoft account, I grew to respect Christian for his laconic and irreverent sense of humour, a strong sense of self-deprecation, his tech and internet savviness long before many people knew what the internet was, and oh, let's not forget his encyclopedic knowledge of film. And I should mention, he was also a willing and able accomplice on many of the debauched nights of drinking in the darkened basement bars of London advertising's then heartland, Soho. Christian has since returned to Paris and ascended the career ladder and is now running boutique Paris agency Les Présidents, where agility is a given, hierarchy is shunned and egos are banished. Clearly it's an agency crafted in his character. As I move forward with this experiment in interviewing and connecting storytellers, difference makers and domain experts, Christian's fresh perspective on problems, his lateral strategic thinking and his disarming humour will certainly open up some new paths for action. If nothing else, there'll be some fun along the way. Just to note, we did have some slight issues with the sound on this episode, but thanks to sound engineer, SoundZ, um, check him in the show notes, and fellow podcaster David Risley, soon to be a guest, these have mainly been addressed, so hopefully you won't notice. Anyway, now over to Christian. <laughs> okay, Christian, welcome to the Impossible Network. Thank you. So let's get started then. Yeah. So to introduce you and contextualize this, we worked together years ago in London yes. at an ad agency. At the time, it was called Euro RCG, part of the Havas Group. When at Gosper. Yeah, when at Gosper in Great Newport mm. Street, in the times when you would get away with some pretty heinous behavior, things you'd be cancelled for now. <laughs> Mm. And, and you were a strategic planner uh, working on the mi mi yeah, Microsoft I, I, account. I started as a, a sort of coordinating uh, uh, account director and I was shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't go as far as that. I think you're... No, I, I, I was not really good. I think when we talk about our gifts and our talents, mm. let's just say your talents and gifts lay elsewhere than the yeah, coordination. That's true. But the funny thing is, as I'm now part of a small agency, um, I'm way more, you know, vertical, mm -hmm. basically. I do some cost estimate. I haggle on the, you know, the, the value of a cost estimate, that sort of things. I see if everything gets well produced. So uh, I'm still, how do you say, the executive, but also head of accounts. And uh, sometimes when I have time, I do some planning. But I do a lot of things. But I suppose that's the so, very nature of being the lead in the organization, that you are the president of an agency called Le President. Yeah, and also because we're, we're small, so we, we've got to do a lot of things. But that's I sort of like it like that. Well, that's good. Well, we, that's what, so what, that's what you do. You get your hands dirty, you do a mm. bit of planning, you do a bit of coordination, you're a leader mm. in the organization. But let's dive in and ask you, who do you actually really think you are? Mr. Bo no. Mr. Beaujard. Mm -hmm. Mr. Beaujard, who do you think you are? I would say I'm the paradox of the guy who would like to be in the shadow and yet being appreciated. That's, that's, that's really paradox. Mm. But, and also, I would start by saying, who, who do I think I am? Not much, but trying to, to, to be good at what I do, how I live, and how I raise my kids, basically. It's a bit, it's a bit of cliche, I know. What but, do you mean by um, being in the shadows? I don't really like being at the forefront, being in the light, in the spotlight. That's why I'm not a creative somehow. And there's a comfort in uh, being in the shadows. Mm -hmm. And I sort of like it like that. I like to see how you nurture something and how it grows and how 
how it's developed and taken into account by others. So do you think, um, to use um, a football analogy, given the World Cup has just ended, sorry, France, that you're more of a playmaker? Yes, I'd be more, yeah. I guess there must be a lot of things going on in the um, changing rooms. I'd be the guy in the changing Back room. room. Yeah. And then on, maybe on the field, but not, I, I wouldn't be a number 10. Mm. Or even nine. I'd be more of a more of a back player. I, I like to defend. I like to see how the game is going. But I, I'm I'll support a striker and that sort of things. But not being a, not really a playmaker, but sort of a pillar somehow. Hmm. So, who made you you, or what made you you? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have three hours personally or professionally? Let's start off personally, because that that's probably oh. defined you professionally also yeah personally i would say um, of course my parents and the sense f from dad the sense of humor mm -hmm. not taking stuff seriously not seeing stuff not not saying so, stuff in a serious manner but always getting to the point and that was key mom is love so that's yeah ma makes you know that's cliche but that's so true and also being pushed, going into, you know, les classes prépa is something of a strange feeling where basically you're going to spend two, two years where you're going to work, 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 learn new stuff, be curious, and then have some exams. And if you're, if you're among the top 200, about, you know, 3000, then you get into the school, that sort of things. Uh, so that was also uh, sort of transformed because you, that's where you learn to, get a lot of information and synthesize it and get, get your ships in order, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very French, basically. The three-part plan, that sort of things, you know, that's very, very uh, French for the good and, and not for the sometimes not so good. And I would say also the army. Ah. The, yeah, yeah, so you... no, the army showed me I was very limited <laughs> in terms, you know, physically and, you know, and the, the things you can endure. Physically, because I was in the um, uh, fusier marin. But th is that because of national service, or is it just? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm I'm one of the last who did the national service because I I did in '93 and Chirac stopped it in '95. And uh, as I was a um, graduate, you go into EOR, which is a reserve officer. So it's 15, 16 months of service as an officer. So you've got the uh, and I was a squad leader in a um, company, but also uh, that, that's where Fusier Marin, that's where you go the commandos, the Marine commando, the French special ops, blah, blah, blah. Uh, took the test, didn't pass it. That's where I, I saw my limits. And uh, so um, it's also something I sort of liked because I knew it, it, it would last only uh, 16 months. Mm -hmm. You know, I would never, I don't think I would be a very good army guy. So I was like, yeah, 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 let's do it. It's an experience. I wouldn't say it's funny. It was funny, but uh, anyway. And then, um, uh, 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 then personally, my wife, my kids, of mm -hmm. course, professionally, I didn't think I would start as a advertising guy. I wanted, you know, the usual path was to go in marketing. Mm -hmm. Basically, you had two roads, uh, accountants, you know, in those times there were Arthur Andersen or, uh, EY, Ernst yeah. Young, that sort of things. Boring, couldn't stand it. So more marketing. So I, I applied for Danone, for uh, all these big giants, these schools of marketing. And then at one point it was like, yeah, how about advertising? I like as a guy who likes advertising from, from the outside. So I went to, um, there was a, an opening at CLM BBDO. That was a, the BBDO French agency. A uh, very good agency, got there, and then uh, slowly I uh, went from national to international accounts, and uh, then moved to London because of Christine, my wife, who got into Yahoo. The, the early days, yeah. And remember, Yahoo, in those times, that was that was like the, the Google of uh, the 2000s, basically. So it was, it was amazing. And I got into Euro, thanks to also Glenn Flaherty. Head of strategic planning. Because I met Glenn uh, when he was at AMV, BBDO, working for Mars, and I was at BBDO France working for Mars too. So I was like, yeah, looking for a job. So, oh, you should contact this, this, and, and these uh, head hunters. And if you go to um, Euro, wow. I, I might give a good word about you. And um, he's still uh, regretting that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> 
And then, well, you know, the other story, met, met you, worked till uh, 2003, I guess, and then got back in France and moved to BDDP, which became then TBWA, and then blah, blah, blah. blah. There, there I'm mean, still at TBWA, basically, but in a small agency of the, mm-hmm. the group. And, um, and I must say, professionally, you changed. Yeah, I mean, you, you had an influence, probably. I had a real influence. Pollyanna Evely. That's a sh- shout out to a planner called Polly Evely, who's now uh, running strategy at Specsavers. They're doing some great stuff, actually. I've seen a poster with, uh, you know, should have gone to Specsavers. And uh, yeah, she convinced me that I should try planning. And she taught me not to base anything on intuition, but on, you know, hard facts, hard, hard figures, basically, and uh, research and core research and the rest. So she, she was my mentor in, in planning. And then I learned, then I read some books, I met all the planners and blah, 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 blah. And th- there I am. And, and today I'm no longer really doing planning stuff. I no longer read a lot of research, you know, uh, Aaron Berg, Bast, uh, um, Byron Sharp and all these, which make perfectly sense, but don't have time for that because we, 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 we have to work really quickly. So the four people who are the most senior, we've got 100 years of experience. So we sort of work well together and we, we've got a lot of, um, say, memorized case studies that help us go quickly. So well, that's about well, it. I mean, it's an interesting journey you've been on, but I want you to reflect a bit more on the role of your sense of humor. And it is something when anyone mm. meets you and anyone that encounters you, it must be quite apparent very early on. You've got this sort of slightly irreverent yes. sense of humor. Do you remember that emerging yes. early in life? And was it something you picked up from your, your mother or father? From, yeah, father. Yeah, definitely. And basically when you are at lunch on weekends, you've got to, to be a bit, a bit of a smart ass, you know, because you're, uh, you're still a kid. And if you manage to do, you know, one uh, jeu de mots, play on words, then you, you've got, you know, plus 100 points. Basically, it's not gamified, but there, there was this feeling of to show, to show my dad that I had that because it's, it's something you acquire. It's, it's not something you're born with. So, uh, uh, that's also how I, I did fit in in school because I'm not really tall. Uh, I had two, a year and a half, basically two years of advance. I got my, my baccalaureate at 16. Wow. So I was like the small one. And, you know, usually in the top, top three or four and, and not very tall. So, uh, I could have been harassed basically, or, you know, I could have been the teacher's pet or whatever, but I wasn't. Perfect casting for special ops working and in, going into the, um, uh, the army. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I could have been shot on basically and wasn't because I had this sense of humor. And had the friends, and so um, and this bit of how would you say left field thinking to the point or where sometimes I used to make some jokes that were somehow going too far. You know, it's it, it's a real uh, challenge to uh, not go too far. You know, to to keep your your sensitivity basically. Okay, so let's ask you the third question. The big question mm. is: What are you working to achieve, or would you like to achieve? I mean, obviously, you've touched on the fact that the family and children are an important yeah. part to you, and that as you get older, naturally priorities change. But it's true. You, it's interesting to reflect now, where you sit at your age, and looking back at the arc of your life, and the world in which we inhabit, which let's say you're <laughs> surrounded in a, a maelstrom of negativity in the in the media cycle. Yet on the ground, working with the types of businesses you do, you must have see signs of optimism and an impact. So, what what is it you really want for the rest of your life? To where do you think you're you're going to direct that both that humor, that intellect, and that experience that you've gained? I'm trying to get rid of the because humor sometimes leads to cynicism. <laughs> it's easy and. Um, the, the root of cynicism is, is dangerous because it goes like, anyway, everything is shit and, and we all dead at the end. So I bother, but plus I don't know what I will, what I will leave in my legacy. I, I have no idea. You should ask when I'm dead. You know, it's a wonderful life, you know, Frank Capra, basically he, he just he thinks he's a sort of a, a normal guy, but he's changed the whole city, but he has to, to die to know that. <laughs> so I don't know. 
good values or, uh, you know, try to be good. But that's, that's a bit of a cliche. I would say try to not be a negative force, mm-hmm. which, which would be something already. I, I'm not saying positive, you know, would be, oh, I'm trying to be a positive force of change. No, but no, I'm trying to not be, to have a, a positive naivety, you know. Let's separate that professionally and from personally. That mm-hmm. must have a daily impact on you because one, you've got children. We're living in a world where it's easy for them to become cynical themselves and fatalistic in terms of when we talk about climate, to give them to pass on your your values. But at the same time, as a leader in an organization with three other colleagues, you know, you've you've got this balance between positive impact and negative impact. You know, how yeah, how do you exactly. lead people? I think there's a professionally is uh, pushing people, you know. It goes from uh, writing something with someone and say, you present that. You know, it's, it could be just that and you take charge of it and you'll be the one facing the client, blah, 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 because I'm, I'm sort of uh, too old for this shit. But no, uh, actually the too old for this shit it has become a sort of a mantra for, for in, in the agency. Mm-hmm. We say tuft, you know, T-U-F-T, too old for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so no, don't ask that because uh, that's, that's not us. We are too old for that. And I guess we're, we're all, as we're quite senior, and we've all made our ways, we're trying to push the others, even if at the end we're still quite hands-on. Basically, we rewrite stuff. We, you know, we, we're a bit of a maniac in terms of PowerPoint presentations and stuff. It has to be, you know, as any agency, I guess. But um, no, stress yes. can be really negative, but sometimes it can be good. And, but... 90% of the time, it's really, it's really not good. You know, relieving the, your pressure on others is the worst thing to do. And whether it's personally or professionally. And personally, you see it immediately. If you start shouting at your, your kids and then you see your kids shouting at themselves, you say, ah, who told them that? Well, you did, you moron. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it's children are, are a real life experiment of, of how you behave basically, because you see exactly how they behave and they, they learned from someone, which is usually you and your, your significant other. So how do you balance that? I think it's a skill you develop in terms of how do you channel stress? As you say, it, uh, there's two sides to it. It's a blade that can cut two ways. Well, I guess your answer would, you'd be for you, you run. <laughs> I actually swim. I like to swim. So that's the physical side. Otherwise, it's, and it's quite hard, but I'm getting better at it. But 10 years ago, I was shit at it. It's getting, you know, some distance. You know, this, uh, oh, it's on the advertising stuff, which is exactly the thing you don't tell yourself when you're, when you're working in advertising. But sometimes it's good to say, Relax, you know, what's the problem? What's, what are the solutions? We're not dealing with the tomb bomb here. We're just dealing with advertising still. We're, we're putting a lot of passion in it, but, and talking, talking to others to talking to, you know, how would you do that? The best way to not let stress take on is to, as soon as you see what you feel you've got a bit of talk, talk, you know, with your colleagues and say, I'm starting to sense I've got this problem. How? Or I will have this problem. How do you think I should manage it? So uh, talking, dialogue, advice, that's the, I think that's the best way. And also, uh, sa- same when you're, you're uh, uh, managing people. If you have a problem, you tell me. So that clear lines of communication, open communication yeah. with mm. children. Which is not, not evident. It's not, it's not as uh, easy as that. You know, easier say than done. But we're trying. Well, same for the kids. I must say, kids are telling us stuff I would not have dared to tell my parents. And I thank them for that. You know, for, I thank my kids because they, they, they answer. I suspect that is a, probably a generational thing. But maybe, yeah. Yeah, but that's good. That's moving mm. in the right direction. Let's pivot to you when you were younger. You're clearly, having worked with you, an incredibly curious person and creative. Not that doesn't mean to say that people who work in a creative department or are, are necessarily have to be are the only creatives, because I think everyone has to be creative in their thinking. But I want you to reflect on that moment or those early memories, a realization that you had this characteristic 
of curiosity, whatever we describe that as. Do you have any early memories? Yeah, actually, we had a lot of books at home, encyclopedias for youth, which was categorized in questions. The first one was comment ça marche, which is how does that work? Brilliant. So it was like, well, the engine or uh, the sun or, you know, all, all this stuff around you. How, do, how does that work? It was really simply explained. The second one was, where is it? So it was sort of geography. <laughs> and I, I read everything. And I, I got also a sort of knack for uh, movies, mainly Walt Disney's, but then action movies, that sort of things. I was sort of a movie nerd and still, uh, still is less, way less. But funnily enough, I had the most memory I have is about, you know, oh, well, you know, this guy played with that and the, the DOP is this guy who did that. You know, it's like totally useless information as I don't work in movies. Well, it's but, a cultural reference point. It's always certainly useful for career yeah. advertising and marketing. True about about you know the what's the angle what's the how do you want to shoot that it's like yeah, in terms of yeah, would you be more uh, uh, the dogma side or would you be more uh, uh, no lighting uh, Barry Lyndon side you know, that sort that sort of things so um, yeah I like movie so uh, uh, the curiosity I think it started with the encyclopedias and and really the two questions which are how does that work which is really naive but it you know when I used to work on BMW I was like how why is the V6 better? And they explained me. I was like, okay, I get it. But, uh, or you just have to go back uh, to one of the old classic ads from WCRS times with the, the martini glass on the engine, shaken, not stirred. And you know, when we had this induction at BMW as an agency, they did exactly the same thing. Because, yeah, I was like, oh yeah, that's really, that's perfect. Let's see, look at the glass. Neither, sh no, not shaken, not stirred. But trying to, yeah, to, to understand how the world works somehow. And, and there's, there's a power in being stupid, asking stupid questions. And I like that. I really like that. Naivety, be naive and stupid. You know, it's the Be Stupid campaign from Diesel. And I think one of the, one, one of the most brilliant campaign, that attitude. Because when you're smart, when you know you're smart, you think you know everything, but you, you've got some, you know, how you say, ready-made thoughts. Whether when you're stupid, you just question everything. Like, yeah, but why is that? Why doesn't this not the other way? So uh, I always try to go with the problem with uh, the most stupid questions. I personally think that's great advice. Reflecting on the people that you manage and the people you encounter and work and also just looking at your children as a, ge a generation apart, do you think that we have lost or some element of curiosity. When you say things like, how does that work or where is that? Do you think it's lacking in today's world that there's too much certainty? Or am I just, or am I just saying that because I see this pol polarization between people? Maybe, maybe. I, I think curiosity has moved from other domains. For instance, something that irritates me is the talking about the, the, the younger generation as the digital native. Yeah. They're not. They don't know how it works. They don't know how to program. They've never, you know, they, they, they know nothing. Okay. They're better than me on TikTok. Maybe, but they don't know what's a server, how it works or how the, even, you know, uh, Zoe, my, my daughter has a Mac. I had to teach her how to use a Mac, basic stuff, but she doesn't know because if you're not taught, how do you learn that? So, uh, curiosity of, let's say digital curiosity of, or, or curiosity of how it works. Maybe it's, mo it has moved from that to another domain. I don't know. Maybe it's that there's so much going on, uh, uh, and with so little attention span that doesn't really, um, encourage you to be curious because you got, you got so, so many messages, informations, images coming at you. Whether well, it's TikTok, Instagram, so because if we are, if we take Tristan Harris mm -hmm. and his whole movement of time well spent, that there is an attention deficit um, disorder being experienced, then the natural sort of outcome of that deficit attention disorder clearly is people don't have enough time to be deeply curious. They haven't got the the empty mind to sort of sit and wonder. Um, I mean, I've been trying to counter that myself. I don't know if you've read the book Solve for Happy by Mo Gaudet. 
Very good. It should get put on your put it on your Christmas list. I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> okay. He had a great uh, has a great habit, which is and it's a, and it's a it's a bit of a luxury. I'll admit it. You have to really force yourself and discipline to to get up early and do this. But to sit for forty five minutes in the morning. Now you could argue it's meditative, but just sit there with a pad of paper or I mean my iPad and my Apple pencil and just start to take notes. Not journal necessarily, but just capture what comes into your head. And it's really interesting. The first few, let's say 15, 20 minutes are lists. Oh, yeah. I must do this. I must do that. And, oh, yeah, yeah. The this. to-do list. Mm. But then it's almost like this hourglass effect and then it opens up and then all these ideas come to you. Mm. And it's usually, it's usually in the last 15 minutes. So you've got to be prepared to go through that barrier. Ah, I should try that. Yeah. And it's a really, it's an interesting exercise, say, um, to let your imagination flow mm. and no, no phone, no alerts, nothing. iPad on airplane mode, and you just capture notes. And it's a really interesting exercise. And I, did, I just wonder if it is something um, that we were having. We have to think carefully about as both as parents, as leaders. Mm -hmm. How do you instill in people? How do we inject more curiosity into the world? Because if curiosity is the input and creativity then is the output. Uh -huh. We need we need more creativity in the world. So um, I want to ask you as a child, I should have asked you this earlier, but you talked about being smaller as a child and using your humor yeah. almost as a, not a weapon, but as a way to fit it. Fit yeah, in. oil. <laughs> yeah, a, a nice yeah, social, a lubricant. Social, <laughs> social lubricant. But do you think that used to fit in and to be accepted um, was something that was just a natural gift. I mean, you talked about it, you came for your father. If I asked you about a gift and a talent, is that central to your gifts and talents? The what, the humor? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Um, to the point where I may have some difficulties to be serious sometimes. No, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, with, with kids mm -hmm. mostly. And one of the reproaches Okay. Is uh, they're telling me you never you never know if it's you're, you're joking or and not. They have to turn to your turn you to know? their mother Christine to get something. Yeah, exactly, and say no, it's not joking. I was like, yeah, but so it has to be uh, uh, used uh, in a you know lightly. But I think it's something so human, basically. Mm -hmm. But I want to continue on that vein. You talked about your humor, and it's obviously being a powerful gift, and and you've leveraged it as a talent to have impact in the world. <laughs> the people you meet, what do people actually, what do people compliment you for, both maybe your children and people you work with or work for? My autograph, the way that I, I don't make mistakes. <laughs> no, that's the one little thing. No, what do they compliment me for? When I know, you know, when you, when you write a good brief and the, the creatives go, oh yeah, I didn't see it like that. And you're like, mm, okay, now I've done something. It's like, oh yeah, you know, it's sort of uh, uh, having another angle, basically. It's not, it doesn't happen every, at every brief, but that's where it, where it's interesting. Where do they compliment? Supposedly I'm good at meetings because I, I sort of lighten things up. Well, that's know, another uh, facet of your humor. Yeah, a little joke here, but sometimes it's, it, it can go too far. So that's also a need to, a bit of a restraint on that. So, but I want to ask um, you about when you talk about briefs, because that's a mindset, a way mm -hmm. of thinking, a way of seeing the world and approaching a problem. How do you nurture that? Let's say, it, I don't know if it's going deeper or taking a lateral view or finding an alternative way in which to see the examples, world. Examples. I'm very narrow in this case. It's... Um, Best strategies, you know, very ad centric, I must say. Saying, oh, yeah, you see how they, how they dealt with this. Like, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and trying to apply that somehow or trying to, to, to get this sort of other angle. Or even the best thing is finding the, the surprising information. Mm -hmm. For instance, we were working for a, a, a Fondation Le Pierre, therefore, a, um, bad housing. You know, in France, you've got 500,000 homeless people, but about 5 million people who are in uh, um, 
bad houses, basically. So bad, standard bad, housing. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, no heating or uh, even uh, um, basically they, there's a, it's, it's a major problem. And uh, uh, one of the first thing we, we learned is um, uh, homeless people. Usually you give to them in, in winter because you say, yeah, it's, it's cold outside and uh, people die from cold outside. Uh, so you, you sort of uh, are more sen- sensitive to uh, homelessness mm-hmm. in winter. Actually, this NGO told us more, more or less die in summer. Why? Because the centers, uh, the shelters are closed and with longer, longer days and heat, you've got dehydration plus alcohol and fights and no shelter means that people who've got some injuries, they, you know, they can die from that, from it. And we're like, wow, you know, something no one knows, basically. More people, more homeless people die in, in summer than in winter. What do you do with that? But that was, you know, the piece of information that makes you sort of reconsider the homelessness, basically, and the, 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 the issue. And when, when you get that, you're, okay, fine, I've got it. Thank you. That's the, the new, the new thing as to say, the new facts and the new information. But when you've got a brief where it's basically a product that could be on par with another one on the market where you've got a lot of competition. So how do you find a new way to, to say something, um, that's not really different? And that, that's where it, it gets interesting. What's the, what's the new angle? What's the new, uh, the new thing you tell or you, you, you put forward? So. What's on your mind in 2023? Huh, depends. Okay, I'm going to do some real mind mapping. Kids mm. who are yeah. <laughs> far right. Mm. Still in France. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could get dangerous because they're in the um, House of Parliament mm. now. So they're getting more normalized. And that's the danger. Uh, polarization, too. You know, the black and white. The... Um, the end of nuance, mm-hmm. the end of thinking too, whereas, um, you know, my way or the highway, just sort of, uh, uh, if you're with me, if you're not with me, you're against me, that sort of things. And of course, climate change. I mean, you know, it's a bit scary, but the more, the scarier it gets, I believe the, um, the more protection, the more, the more sort of, uh, um, evasion strategies we have. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a tough question. Want, yeah. Oh. I mean, obviously the, the, it's not just on your mind that the, what comes to your mind is a combination of everything you're witnessing, but also the conversation you have with people, both within mm. your client base, your staff, your family, your friends. But you've just named a whole raft of big, gnarly problems that we face, whether yeah. you know, whether you're in Germany. I mean, everyone's obviously de- dependent on where you are. Proximity to war can be is varied, but it's everyone has been touched at some point by this war that's happening in Ukraine, mm. but and climate change, regardless of people's views on its causes, I think most people now accept it's happening and also may vary, have varied views on how we address it. But as a, a leader, as a leader in a French agency, given that agencies are masters of communication and persuasion and of understanding behavior as well and affecting behavior change. I don't want to go into any particular one of them, but you you know everything from climate to lack of nuance to polarization, a lot of those things come down to people's individual and collective viewpoints. How do you think agencies can do more as a collective, as a force for good, to maybe address? You know, I think it's a big question, but you as you know, you're part of a, a network in in France of agencies, both national and international. Do, do you yeah. think there is there a narrative happening at the leadership level that agencies should maybe come together to coalesce and to direct their collective talents to confront some of the bigger societal problems? Collectively, no, because the paradox of you know advertising is part of capitalism. I don't think collectively there's a, a force in the um, sector. If you look at the, the, the awards shows, they've all now got these award categories, which is maybe their way of trying to encourage more purpose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The purpose. Ah, oh, fuck purpose. I wouldn't call it cynicism from my side, but I think it's a lot of them is bullshit, mm-hmm. frankly. It's a thin veil, you know, they sort of put down, oh, let's talk about purpose. 
first, you know, try to make good products in a good way without being an asshole uh, for people, I mean, towards people or towards the environment. And then that's, that's your purpose, basically. And your purpose is also to make profits. And then how you use your profits, then that's another question. And you should, you should use them in, in the best way uh, possible. But, um, okay, Patagonia, I don't think Patagonia was born with a purpose. They was born with a, you know, let's do the best thing with the, uh, w while trying not to, uh, be an asshole to the environment. And they, they, and now they, they, everyone says, oh yeah, that's the purpose company. I'm not sure they, they were, they, they had this purpose, the world purpose as when it was created. And everyone now is, is trying to, to say, yeah, what, well, what's the purpose? Um, uh, Jeremy Belmore wrote something. It was really, you know, no bullshit about purpose. And I, I, I'm quite, uh, can you, sh can you share that? And I'll put them in the show notes. I'll, I'll try. I'll try to find that. Yeah. Do you think it's a, do you think it's a byproduct of the uh, UN's global goals? The fact that we have these 17 sustainable development goals and that corporations in the pursuit of, mm -hmm. pursuit of profit see Given that there's a, an expectation of yes. to be mindful socially and environmentally, that it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's forced mm -hmm. both the reaction from marketing and the C-suite to then be passed on to their agencies to find a narrative. Yes. Some of, some of this research showed that basically at the beginning, you know, everyone was saying, because that's what consumers want. Actually, no, because it was based on a question was like, would you rather buy from a company that is purposeful or, or not purposeful? And people would say, yes, of course I would. And then it turns out that it got twisted into, oh yeah, consumers want brands with purpose, but actually, you know, consumers just want products with a, a right price, uh, and not being, uh, uh, devastating for the environment somehow. But, you know, even Philip Morris has a purpose. There is a, a, a sort of brand manifesto of Philip Morris with the purpose. You're like, come on, guys. <laughs> Your purpose is what? To maintain people alive a bit longer so they can sell, still, still sell some cigarettes. I, I understand the positive force behind, but I think it's been, it's just like greenwashing, basically. There's a purpose washing going on and I, I don't really like it. I think it's, it's been wrongfully used somehow. Okay. If you were in a position, let's say in France, where you could coalesce talent and skill set across the industry to focus on changing and improving one aspect of the issues that you've just laid out that you're wit witnessing, <clears throat> which one would it be? And who would you need to connect with to affect a change or an improvement? Um, there's, a, there's a hierarchy of issues you've just laid out. Mm. Wow. You mean just in France? Well, I think, I, I mean, I, this is something, a conversation I'm beginning to have with people about. It's, we, mm. we talk about the global goals and we talk about impact and change and problems worth solving, but problems aren't solved at the global level. They're solved at the hyper-local level. I mean, you're yeah. talking, you gave a great example of homelessness in, 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 in France. I mean, we don't solve, um, we have to look at our cities, our communities, our neighborhoods, where we can solve problems. So let's take that as an example then. What would you do in Paris as a leader of an agency in Paris? Um, I think I would start with inclusion. It's still a white male industry. We are slightly opening, but when you see, just talking about Paris, the, the power and the creativity the guys in the surroundings have, you know, the les quartiers, we say, the quarters. Yeah. And let's take the drug market, mm -hmm. you know, hashish or stuff, and how they use social media, how they use marketing, how they, you're like, wow, these guys, they know, you know, they sometimes you say, they, 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 could, they could open a school of marketing. There's, there's they maybe know everything. a startup idea there, Christian. Yeah, I mean, if France one day uh, legalize, let's say, uh, weed and hashish, these guys, they've learned everything. They know everything. And I think there's a lot, a whole reservoir of talents that we should use and uh, uh, nurture. And we're not doing that. 
And instead of that, we're, we're saying, oh yeah, that's the la banlieue, that's the quarters, that's the, the migrant. Yeah. I don't know if it's same in, in the UK or in, in Texas, but we've moved language, you know, is really important. We've moved from refugees, les réfugiés, to migrants. And migrant in France is not very far from something you sh you'd say from an insect. You know, it's, it's the refugee is very humane. Migrant is, is uh, totally dehumanizing these people. If two of my recent guests before I took the hiatus in the podcast were Sana Mustafa and uh, Nagar Tayar, who are both working to <laughs> reframe the way we lead with the issue. And they call it not refugees, but displaced peoples. But Even because later. The, and the issue they identify is that most of the organizations, the NGOs that are leading in the refugee NGOs are all white male <laughs> Westerners. And there needs to be leadership coming from these displaced communities to be part yeah. of it because they understand the issues. So I think it's, you know, even you're seeing, you're seeing a, a shift going in the opposite direction when we need to actually drive it in the direction yeah. that people like Sana there, yeah. and Nagar yeah. are, are working on. It's interesting as you, you talk about that, I couldn't help but think about the French team and the fact that it's made up of predominantly people from old cop. Ah, be careful what you're going to no, say. No, all, all, all <laughs> colonies of the French. That if the, yeah, if, that's true. If, mm. if the French football team was mirrored to look like the French communications industry. Yeah, but, but that, that's, that's but, but exactly what you're saying. But this is the point yeah. you're, I think this is the point you're making, that if you've got this. Yeah, it was the Mbappe of advertising, basically, you know. I think, I think you need to run an ad for, in mm. the trade press around the mm. French football team and the French communications industry. We know what the Platini is, because Platini, you know, was a, a second generation Italian. That's true. I mean, one of their way out is football. But I mean, it shouldn't just be football. It's not. This is, this is the issue. That's, yeah, that, that's a bit of... Hmm. But that opens, up a, that, that bit opens that. up a whole sort of question of education, economic opportunity, segregation, <laughs> housing, all the things that you're, you're, you've already you've touched on. And on... The lighter or sunnier side, I'm a teacher uh -huh. at Sciences Po Paris. It's been 10 years now, and we're, we're having courses on, uh, I mean, lecturing on advertising. Mm -hmm. Masters, so it's like uh, they are about 21, 22, 23. And we've seen how the students have evolved in terms of representation. And Sciences Po used to be the, the real foyer, basically, of a white male Catholic in France, where all the politics are, are issued, basically. It's getting way more diverse. So it is starting exactly. to, to change, which is good. But yeah, there's still a lot of uh, um, progress to be made. Same with uh, uh, women versus men. Same. Okay. I... Why is a woman still 25% uh, less paid than a man? I don't know. So while we're continue to, well, we think we make progress, there is still a long way to go. And yet we're on the verge of what many people are saying, the greatest threat to humanity, but also a great opportunity, which is the AI revolution. You, having mentioned mm. you, that you are, you're teaching and you're coaching people in advertising, in creativity, let's say, and you've worked with so many different creative people. How, how do we, how are we going to address that? We've, AI? Well, how do we refocus or what happens to our creativity, our, our natural creativity, which we always thought was the differentiator between where AI would meet its limits. Mm. But we're seeing things like chat, GPT, stable diffusion, and all these different sort of emerging DALI, all these the, uh, emerging applications of AI. And we haven't even reached anywhere near general intelligence yet. No, that's just the beginning. What, mm. what are your views or what are your sort of sense and the conversation that's in your happening in your industry and what do we do about it i mean i i don't think anyone's got an answer but i'd love your i'd love no, your, I don't your know. sense of where we're we're headed the way i see it right now and i might be totally wrong i think it's uh the output is a new way to be creative as in because at the end you you will judge if it does the thing or if it doesn't you still need to to have the human judgment on that is it you know is it interesting or or sometimes you know Maybe with the glitches and the, uh, uh, the thing that happens, that sort of, that could spark something like, oh, you know, the machine did that. And I'm like, oh, there's something interesting there. 
we should, we should, we should carry on this. But otherwise, no, I, I have no idea. Really, no idea. I think AI could, yeah, replace most of the ads digitally. No problem. Even better, because some some are really shit. At least I I hope that it would be maybe better written, uh, uh, structured. But asking an AI to maybe uh, maybe to tap into universal truth or universal insight or that sort of things, mm, maybe maybe they will. I don't know. I actually don't see it as a threat. I see it as a new as a new game. Could I challenge you to something? Mm. You're you. I don't know if you do events and, mm. with your agency, but I think what you should do, and I would love to see you find time to do it, is to run an event in Paris where you invite a panel mm. of people across the industry to talk about and dis- to discuss, like a debate, AI, power for creative good or power for creative destruction, and you know how <laughs> what people's views are on it, to really start to open up this debate and, and, and make mm. it happen. Because I think, I, th- I think like any technology, you know, regardless of time, it's no difference, it's just another tool of technology. It can be u- yeah, used exactly. for good or bad, and it's how we harness it. Because as you were talking about, you know, shit ads, particularly in the digital sort of realm, you know, you start to think, well, if you could actually tap into sort of a, a database of every ad ever generated and its impact, you could start to see AI refine advertising communications, mm-hmm. which would the render the, the risk-averse client decisions that often go for the more mundane and the safe space rendered obsolete, mm. which could be a good thing for agencies yeah. and marketing. So that in just that one small facet, it, it, could be, it could be useful. But how it then re-engineers the way the structure of agencies, roles that people play, the role of an art director, the role of the writer, the role of the, the mm. strategic planner to find the insights. And the creative director, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. it's a conversation I challenge you, Christian, as part of this podcast <laughs> to go out and have, and then, <laughs> and then I'll come back to you in the next year and find out how that conversation went. <laughs> well, first, I, I would need, I, I haven't tried yet to chat to GPT. I will well, try that. That's, my, that's some, on my... Something um, I'm planning to do over the next few days as I was playing around with it and I was putting in famous end lines. So just do, I put in just do it. And it tells you, mm-hmm. it gives just do it and an explanation of just do it. I put in think different and, the ex- and I'm going to start posting it in social media. It's, r- it's very uh-huh. interesting what, how it interprets those end lines. Okay. Well, that's your challenge is to do that. Yeah. First, I, I need to learn a bit, a bit more about AI. Yeah. yeah. We, because we're starting this out, this, this new iteration of the podcast to create what we're calling <laughs> random collisions. Between people like yourself who are create, innately creative and curious and are, are problem solvers with people who are working, let's say, at the sharp end of solving some big problems, maybe hyperlocally, maybe globally, and try and bring them together. But at the same time, I believe that all conversations and explorations in thought have a serendipitous impact. So I'd like to ask you, what serendipitous impact would you like this podcast interview to have? First one would be to create some um, connections. First one is speaking to you, basically. You know, it's been, it's been like years, so it's a good thing. Um, and no beer either. We should have brought one. No, no beer. Uh, or champagne or tatty buggles. <laughs> well, that's a story. Yeah. For anyone listening, when we worked in advertising back in the day in the 90s, it was a famous, yeah. infamous, I should say, sort of yeah. members club. A basement. Mm. I don't even, know, the, even using the word members club is probably going too far. It was a club that was opened by British Scottish soldiers in the 1914-18 war in London as a place to go. I didn't oh, yeah, know that. That's that, 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 no. the history of it. So there was a history. Oh, yeah. yeah. Way so back, we, we, a basement bar in hmm. Kingley Court in, in Soho called the Tatty Bogle Club. And I somehow managed to blag because I had my, Scot- my, my light Scottish accent that I was a hmm. member there. And I don't know how they used to let me in. And we used to spend many a dangerous night in the dungeons of the Tatty Bogle Club in this small, tight space with a piano, a bar, and uh, mm. many too many drinks and way too late way into the too nights. Many. And I actually went back there during the summer and when I was in London and went to Kingley Court and they now have... Is it still the same? Well, no, they've, they've still got that same basement space, but it's turned into a new bar. It's much more salubrious. <laughs> When I, t- I tried to tell the, them about it, they had no idea. And I thought it's probably best consigned to the past. Mm. 
but the the walls remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's a, a story for another day. Okay. So connections. So yeah, so, connections so, would be something. So my my question um, to you then: What would your ask be? Because so people that are listening to this within our Impossible Network community of listeners, what would your ask be to them? Yeah, I read this question. I was like, um, the question is, um, I'm a very big user of Twitter. As a reader, I don't comment, I don't post, and I've met there some very funny, very clever, very interesting people. I'm not the, oh, Twitter's gone to, to mm-hmm. shit. I've seen Twitter going to shit, but my experience of Twitter is, is really positive because I don't post, basically. So but, I don't feel, you, I do not feel the trolls. You connect with people. Yeah. No, I connect, I just read them. Just read, you know, so you, you have to be selective. And uh, um, my ask would be, you know, when Twitter is going to the dogs, let's make an in, in, impossible twist <laughs> sort of network where people are, you know, it's sort of the, the, the bright side of Twitter mm-hmm. would be interesting. Well, that's what they're trying to do with post.news. Have you signed up to it yet? No, but no. it's interesting. I'm using it. And I think, you know, the, it's a guy that he was the founder of Waze. Mm. sold to Google and he's trying to create a a version which is I think the only real rules are that you can't be insulting to other people as long as something is factual or something is reporting something you've seen or you can post things as long as it's not derogatory or damaging intentionally damaging Mm. of another individual or a group I think that's sort of the basis of it and so far I found it quite engaging I'm using it Probably 50 50 with Twitter between the two. Ah, oh, so it's post news. news. Yeah, it's, int- it's an interesting sort of evolution. So I'll try that. But yeah, we'll definitely, I mean, over this year, as I start to expand the podcast, we will create a community platform for conversation and connection. But I'm not sure. I don't really want to do it on Facebook groups. So I'm looking at the moment to build, to look at what platform we build on this membership platform where people can come in and connect and, 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 create conversation and build community. My question to you is, would you be willing for me to create a random collision between you and other members of the Impossible Network community? As a guinea pig, yes. Cool. Okay. Just to have the output of, thank you, Christian, but no, thank you. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see what random collisions and I can make. Yeah, it was really not interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Thank you. one thing I'm continuing with this from the other interviews, I always ask the final question to ensure that this be- continues to be a serendipitous network. Uh, Who do I interview next? Oh. Um, mm, <laughs> it's like, is it like the ice bucket challenge? Basically, you, you, you need to pass it on you to someone else. On. Someone, you, some, oh, someone you know cool. that you think I should interview. Okay. Well, let me touch base with you on that. I'm actually thinking about two guys. Yeah. Would, it, would there be another? Oh, three, but they're all head of planning. There's the head of planning of DDB, head of planning of uh, TBWA, and a planning of uh, Besmat, uh, the smart, you know, the, the funny agency in France right now. Feels like very narrow, you know. Planners just, just talking. trust in the process, Christian. Yeah, I, I'll I'll contact them and see if they're interested. Mm. So, Christian, okay. thank you for being a willing a guinea pig, a guest, and uh, and <laughs> to being so open and honest with your answers, and really appreciate mm-hmm. it. And I look forward to the collisions that result from this podcast. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Merci beaucoup, Marc. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Merci. Christian. Okay, that's all for now, folks. Now, here's my ask of you. Please follow this podcast on Apple or Spotify or whatever player you use. Also, please subscribe to our new Random Collisions newsletter. We really are working to build a global community of action takers, action engines of people that really care about the problems that need solving. Thank you very much, and see you next time.